So for the last three and a half decades, Nunez, who has published, published her first novel in 1986, has been exploring characters who transit back and forth, both literally and emotionally, between two cultures, Caribbean and the US, people who, like all of us in this country, whether we consider it or not, are caught up and shaped by the legacies of the European excursion in America. Um, her characters have to consider this legacy. They're not permitted to forget it. And the way that they navigate this long ache of history uh, is, is one of her main themes. Her body of work, which now encompasses 10 novels, a memoir, numerous critical articles, and the anthology um, Blue Latitudes, uh, the writing of Caribbean women writers, uh, is its own very personal map of this complicated inheritance in, in all of the different parameters that she's covered in all these books. Um, for retellings of Shakespeare's The Tempest and King Lear, she has a PhD in English from NYU. Her work is has copious reference to the canonical works. Um, to her latest novel about uh, a young Caribbean ac academic visiting a Bennington-like college in Vermont and confronting the reality of police brutality, Nunez's work has been widely admired. Her, her novel, Bruised to Biscuits, won the American Book Award. Her novel, Beyond the Limbo Silence, won the Independent Publishers Book Award. Her memoir, Not for Everybody's Everyday Use, won the 2015 Hurston Wright Legacy Award, to name just a few of her accolades over the years. She also possesses a quality that I think too often goes unnoted in introductions like this, and that is that she has not just been a good literary citizen, but an exemplary one. Um, someone who has worked to advance others' work for years at the cause of the literature itself. She co-founded the National Black Writers Conference at the Center for Black Literature at Andrew Evers College, a conference that she directed for 14 years, and co-produced uh, a CUNY TV show and the nominated Black Writers in America and chairs PEN America's Open Book Committee, uh, as well as jurying of literary prizes. Um, and I now know that she does this all after nine o'clock in the evening, in the morning, because she writes from five to nine. So um, in any case, uh, I, I'm still sleeping when she st starts her other work. Um, Hunter College is lucky to have her on the faculty. We are lucky to have her here with us this evening. So please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you for being here. Some of you I know. And thank you for my colleagues and the students who are here. Um, I'm just going to say very briefly, I'm going to read two short passages from, um, from this novel. Um, basically, uh, the inspiration for the novel, the epigraphs of the novel are Ivy Bazell and Martin Luther King Jr., who, who talk about that the worst that silence is what lets um, evil continue when good men say nothing. And so the situation my Lila finds herself in is that she has witnessed the fatal shooting of by a policeman of a, of, a, of a black man who happens to be one of the three black professors in that college. Um, she has no sense of being black, although she is black, but she has a better sense of her being a Caribbean, that she's a Caribbean person. And so her fiance back home tells her, don't get involved in this. This is not your business, don't. But she has a sense that they are the activist students on campus and the two remaining black faculty have expectations. They expect to, to side with them. So there we go. It had, been, it had been two weeks since Ron Brown was killed. And it seemed as if collectively, the citizens of the town of Mayfield had amnesia. As Lila made her way down Main Street to the college, 
Mayfield appeared to her to be the quintessential quiet New England village she had read about in travel books. Steeple churches, white picket fences, houses painted in reserved New England colors, the same colors in tropical countries could dazzle the eye. But here the reds were brick colored, the yellows almost mustard, the greens mirroring forest firs. On long tree-lined streets, couples walked hand in hand with their well-behaved rosy-cheeked children. One would be hard pressed, she thought grimly, to convince a stranger that just before long, thick trails of blood had been scrubbed clean in front of the restaurant, where a relatively young black man, a professor at Mayfield College, was shot dead by the police, while astride a white woman who had OD'd on heroin. But it was a warm day, even for 34, and nothing spoiled the Disney fairy, fairy tale image maybe presented. The leaves on the trees were already turning into brilliant reds, russets, and gold, and the lake at the end of the street glittered gloriously in the brilliant sunshine. Lila passed the restaurant where the shooting had taken place. It was bustling with lunch customers, though the large Front window pane. Through the large front window panes, she could see them laughing and chatting happily over stuffed plates and frosted glasses. No alcohol in the iced glasses. The good town of Mayfield did not permit alcohol in the middle of the day. There were others, though, who she could tell were not at ease, not comfortable with what had happened in their town in front of the restaurant. She could see them bent over their plates from time to time, glancing at the entrance as if expecting something ominous to appear, the ghost, the ghost of Professor Brown, perhaps, or perhaps Adriana, who is the white woman, limp, pale-faced, about to slide down on the pavement before the man had the misfortune to catch her, and then, even more disastrously, for him, that is, to straddle her. Lila shook her head. Too few of them seemed troubled. Most of Mayfield had already dismissed the shooting and the near death of a woman destroyed by heroin as a rarity, something that was very unlikely to happen again. It was an event that deserved to be forgotten, and their gaiety reassured them of the righteousness of their decision. But what about the students? Had they forgotten too? Along the narrow paved path toward the cafeteria, which was in the building directly opposite to the academic wing of the college, Lila saw no evidence that the attitude of the students was any different from that of the townspeople. In the quad, they were sitting on the lawn, clustered in circles, chatting animately with the, each other. Some students turned their heads towards her when she passed by, but the second she caught their eyes and was about to raise her hand in greeting, they turned back. They lowered their voices too, for the peals of laughter she had heard moments before suddenly quieted. Then she saw the banner. It was stretched across the wall at the entrance of the cafeteria next to the student notice board, Black Lives Matter. The words were written in large black letters on a white sheet. Standing in front of the banner was a group of students, male and female, wearing black sweatshirts and hoods drawn over their heads. When she reached the top step, they stood at attention, one hand raised defiantly in a fist. Black Lives Matter, one of them chanted. Lila smiled nervously. What was she expected to do, to say? Was she to return their salute? She had seen other faculty pass through the door before her. The students had not saluted them. A loud voice called out her name. Elaine, one of the remaining two black professors, hurrying towards her, her colorful caftan fluttering like wings behind her. Come, come, sit with us. She waved at the students standing at the door. They raised their fist, acknowledging her. Black Lives Matter, they chanted in unison. There are just two of us, you make three. Elaine winked. Get your food and join us at our table, us. She was part of us. The students in front of the Black Lives Matter banner had recognized her. They had drawn her into their protest, she and she alone not the white faculty who had entered the cafeteria just before she did. She remembered a game she played as a child and the song that went with it. There's a brown girl in a ring, tra-la-la-la-la, 
There's a brown girl in a ring, tra la 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 la. -la. There's a brown girl in a ring, tra la 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 la. And she's sweet like a sugar and a plum, plum, plum. On the island, she was a brown girl, sweet like sugar and a plum, plum, plum. She had said to her fiance, she was black. This was a, a, a realization that just happened. Did that, mean she, did that mean she was not a brown girl? Did her nationality not count? That it was more important to be black than to be a Caribbean woman? Her fiance had called her back later that night. So am I black too, he asked. In America, you are black if there's African blood in your ancestry, he said. She said. And what if there's more Caucasian blood, he asked. She was silent. So they will define me? Is that it, Lila? I must abdicate my right to define myself? She had no answer to give him. So um, Lila is realizing as any immigrant of color who has African ancestry, you soon has to realize that you have to choose sides when you come here. So she can't be a brown girl in a ring. So in this scene, this confrontation now is with the male um, black faculty remaining. His name is Terence. Terence was walking down the corridor when she spotted him. Two male students flanked him, one of them speaking to him passionately, his hands punching the air. I didn't expect a visit from you, he said, unlocking his office door to let her in. I hope I didn't interrupt your conversation with your students, she said. He laughed. Conversation? That's an odd way to describe it. Do you have conversations with your students? Sometimes, she said, following him into his office. Her eyes swept across the room. Pictures of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and some black men and women she did not know were mounted on the wall. There were books everywhere, some of them on the ground, apparently having fallen off the tightly packed bookcase, which was sagging slightly to one side. She was aware he had been watching her as she scanned his office. It was half the size of hers. There was barely enough space for his desk, two chairs, and the bookcase, but there was a window. She walked towards it. You got a great view of the mountain from here, she said. I could have asked for a bigger office, he said, but I like seeing that mountain. It reminds me that there's a God. The eyebrows shot up. Surprise? Did you think I was a heathen, an atheist? Most black Americans believe in God, you know. We are probably the most religious people in America. You can barely walk two blocks in a black neighborhood before you run into a church. You must have heard the Negro spirituals. Amazing grace, she said. Well, we didn't write that one. If you go to the Library of Congress, you'll see this inscription, words, John Newton, melody unknown. But we know where the melody came from. It came from the bowels of the slave ship, from the groans, the cries, the prayers of enslaved Africans, from the clanking of iron chains around their legs. Here, listen. She waited as he beat out the sorrowful rhythm with his foot. Dum, 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 dum. The thumps harder and ferocious against the thinly carpeted floor. John Newton was the captain of a slave ship, he said, stilling his foot. That's where he heard that painful melody. He had a conversion, but before that, he bought and sold human beings, trafficked them on a slave ship that stacked Africans attached to each other like floorboards, heads to feet, feet to heads in the holes of ships, and then dragged them chained by their necks and ankles to my part of the world. He searched her face as if expecting a response from her. When she said nothing, he added, drive them to your world too. I see Martin Luther King Jr., she said. Everybody knows Martin Luther King Jr., he said gruffly. He stretched his top lips stiffly over his teeth and shook his head. She winced. And Malcolm X, she said, quickly feeling the sting of his scorn. You have an excellent photograph of him. His face relaxed. King has a national holiday, but without Malcolm X, I think it would have been harder for him to get the people behind him. I'm talking about the grassroots who marched through the streets. His mother was from Grenada, she said, from my part of the world. He frowned at her momentarily and then swiped his hand across his mouth and said, I didn't mean to imply, oh, you said enough. Is that why you're here? 
where I, where I came, come from, we were the seasoning place where they tried to break the Africans, ready them for the plantations. Sit, sit, he pointed to the chair facing the desk. I shouldn't have talked like that, saying it's not your fight. I know racism does not only happen in America. What I meant with meant was he sat down and shoved away the pile of papers in front of him. But this is our country, Lila, and we have to solve our problems. African-Americans have to take the lead. There was an intensity in his voice that had compelled her to make an admission she had not planned. I saw when that policeman shot Professor Brown. In an instant, his face darkened and rose of thin wavelets crossed his forehead. He pressed his hands on his desk and bent towards her. His shoulders raised, his muscles on his neck strained. Did you tell this to anyone? I told Robert. Robert, my fiance, she said, back home. So are you going to report what you saw? I'm not sure it would help, she said. They, the police may not put too much worth in what I have to say. And why is that, Lila? I'm here only as a visitor and, and what, Lila? And I can't be sure of what you saw. Her fingers twitched nervously. If she reported what she believed she saw, she would have to go to court as a witness. She would need a lawyer and she did not have money for that. And what would be the word of her word against the word of an American officer of the law? She was here at the pleasure and goodwill of the US government. It was the US government that had granted maybe college permission to hire her. Her work permit could be young. She could be sent back home. She knew Terence was waiting for her answer. She looked down on her hands. She could not bear the glare from his eye. But you did see, right? His eyes were still fixed on her. You said, you saw. I said I saw when it happened. I cannot be sure that I saw what happened. Terence threw back his head and laughed. It was a laugh without humor, a sad, accusatory laugh, a fine distinction, but a distinction all right between when and what. But I don't blame you, Lila. Like I said, this is not your problem. You can go back to your sunny island. We live here. We have to face racism here. I wanted you to know, she said softly. To know what? That Professor Brown was innocent. He laughed again. My dear West Indian dude, you do not have to tell us that. We know. We have decades, hundreds of years of knowing. The police are always right. Black men like Professor Brown are always wrong, always guilty in their eyes. He began gathering his books and papers on his desk. I have to go, those students. He pointed to the door. I told them I'd meet them in the library. He was dismissing her, but his condescension had irked her too. My dear West Indian girl, he said. He let her leave first, standing back politely at his office door to let her pass through, and then he walked away in the opposite direction. He was angry with her. She could hear his footsteps clacking noisily down the hallway, and perhaps she had given him reason to be condescending. She was a coward. She had scorned her way out of taking a stand with a simpering what and when, yet she had a legitimate excuse, sensible reason for not committing herself to a statement that would implicate her as a witness that could invalidate the police officer's claim, accuse him of lying. This was not her country. She could be deported, deported. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should sweep for her? The lines drifted through her head, Hamlet paralyzed by inaction, in awe of an actor who is moved to tears by the death of someone the actor could never have known. She felt ashamed, and I will stop there. Questions about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mike, is there anybody else on there? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, we talked already in class a certain amount, so uh, we've, we've gone back and forth a bit. But um, I just wanted to ask. Is there um, your experience of the, the very politics that you're describing in this book? And I know from what we talked about earlier that this story actually comes from an earlier mm -hmm. time. Um, 
in a way, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I'm, I'm wondering how you think about for people now describing contemporary politics in in fiction. How do I feel about? It? Well, no, I mean, in other words, how you think about it in terms of the the representing things like Black Lives Matter, there are news in the news like, because people, I think, writers wonder, can I write? in a very contemporary vein of things that are happening as we speak almost and how that works for you as a writer okay so um this was uh, yeah the situation but i think that when you see a theme something that strikes you immediately you're not ready to write it you're not ready to convert that experience into art you need aesthetic distance you need some time to figure out the meaning of it and so out of something I read about maybe 20, 30 years ago, the thing that, the meaning that I took out of it is, do you have a responsibility to speak, to get involved, to do something? And I sort of up the ante by making that person be a, an immigrant. That's one thing. So you have a good excuse. I don't have to get involved. Secondly, I make her a black immigrant, although she, you know, she's not from America, she's a Caribbean black immigrant, which would suggest to her that she needs to get, another reason she needs to get involved because it was a black man who was fatally shot. And so basically the question I am going through, the thing that the, the issue I'm dealing with is not, not so much the action of the police brutality, uh, but the, our responsibility to get involved and that we could have a multitude of reasons why not to get involved. And I guess I'm zeroing on the immigrant because I am myself an immigrant, um, that while America offers you a lot of opportunities, we don't stop to think about how these opportunities came about, how these, up that they weren't just there. And this is especially for uh, people of color. And I don't just mean black people. I think about the um, Immigration Act of 1965, which came on the heels of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the two came together. And before that Immigration Act, there was one of 1924, which put quotas, right? And those quotas were favorable to Northern Europeans, and they were not favorable to Southern Europeans. And for all of Africa, the quota was something like 1,200. <laughs> and for the whole of uh, um, India, it was something like that number two. So when I say that immigrants don't think about it, um, and this, you know, this is something I, you know, I've had, I had to learn. I, I didn't. I, had to find this out myself, uh, is that 1965, the change in the immigration law addressed that inequality. The change was nation, um, national origin was not to be used as a criteria for immigration. So wherever you came from was not a criteria for immigration. That is what opened the doors for people of color from Asia, from Africa, from the Caribbean, um, from Southern Europe, that is it. So I, I'm so I'm also interested that that an immigrant could could find these opportunities in America and not know American history and remain outside and not contribute to the progress of justice in America. So in general, I'm talking about anyone's responsibility for that, but specifically, I'm talking about the immigrant uh, acknowledging that. And even more specifically, I'm talking about the black immigrant. Um, do they have a responsibility to join with the causes of black Americans? Of course, my Lila is there an academic. She can there to go teach. <laughs> in the university, what the heck is she to be doing that? And her fiance back home tells her that. And so she, little by little, she's learning about American history and she's understanding. Her. And so 
she's kind of, whether she wants it or not, the students see her as black. And the students, whether she wants it or not, see her, pull her into their protest, Black Lives Matter. And you know what Black Lives Matter means? You are pulled into this just because of the color of your skin. And she said, oh no, not, not really. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be there. And then but the next scene I read at, um, about the faculty is guy saying, don't give me lip service here. Don't give me lip service about when and where and what. You're either going to be a witness or you're not. I don't want to hear all your little excuses. So, um, so it has many levels of it, and I hope um, it doesn't speak specific, specifically to immigrants or specifically to Black Caribbean immigrants, but to all of us. Hi, Elizabeth. That was lovely. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Um, as um, there's so many students here, so uh, as a fiction writer, I just want to know like what the thing you struggled with as a writer. So as a fiction writer, what did you struggle with most in this book? Was it and was it always um, in third person? Did you try first person? I mean, you are an academic. Um, you are you know a teacher. Um, what did you struggle with? Well, first, the discipline. <laughs> you know, it's not easy work. It's hard work. And there are many things you want to do. Instead of sitting down at your desk with a computer in front of you for hours and hours. So um, you have to push yourself through that. Um, when people tell me that they have a, a, a block, a writing block, I say, I've never had that. I mean, I wouldn't define it like that. It isn't that I have a block. It's that I can't, I don't, I'm resisting pushing myself to that point where I have to work. The wonderful thing is you get in the zone um, if you push yourself there. So that's my first problem. And there are many ways to solve it. Um, my house is cleanest when I'm writing because I found myself, oh, because it's not satisfaction. You know, if you polish the, the table, you polish and it shines. Oh, you clean the floor, you sweep it and it, it's good. So there's that I'm doing something good. So well, it's just fooling yourself, right? So you, you, you're sort of pulling up, you know, there. and it's all kind of a trick. You know, I do all kinds of tricks and then you get there. Uh, another trick is to open a book of a book writer that you, you love and you admire. And you know that writer had to have gone through the same thing. You know that writer had to sit down in silence and had to spend hours and come up with something so magnificent. And so it gives you confidence and whatever. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but so that's it. After that, when you get in the zone, I am with my character. I'm with my character. I'm all in with my character. Oh. Now, what makes me all in with my character? I think most writers are writing, I think all the writers I admire are writing about something they feel passionately about. And they are exploring that through fiction. Um, they're creating this world, this little slice. I mean, you can't take on the whole world, take a little slice, a little time. Your setting, your place, the time and everything. And you have your character and you are, in that character. So I'm no longer, I'm not me in this, in this novel, although I'm not in my passion and experience. I'm Lila. Um, hopefully not too much like Lila, <laughs> but um, that sort of, and I'm throwing all my experience in it. Um, and I think we talked about that at one point in faculty meeting, you and I anyhow. Um, what it feels like to, and Susan, who was one of my students, what it feels like, um, for me, I have the misfortune, but also the fortune of loving opera. Now that's considered a white thing, but I love it. And the reason I love it is my father used to play this all the time in the house. And I would see it in the movies. I couldn't go there, but I'd see it in the movies. And it just, and, and it's so crazy, you know? Crazy thing. It's you have to 
suspend all disbelief <laughs> and look at this crazy thing, but I love it. But when I go to it, I'm no longer Elizabeth. I'm a black woman walking in there, in the mess. There's a black woman walking, and it drives me nuts. So I know what the situation is. I mean, people are looking at me with nice smiles on their faces. <laughs> so that's a wonderful that she's here. I don't know be here. You know? Oh. So the notes I tell the class, and she, I brought her into one of the, which one? What did we see? Oh, we went to the symphony. Yeah. yeah. And I'm raising my granddaughters the same way. Uh, they have the advantage of that happening to them since they were young. But um, I, I squirm for them, but they're not noticing that they're too young. But I squirm for them when we sit there and we get these, you know, it, I mean, people are talking about us. People are smiling. Um, patronizing me. Oh, isn't your granddaughter so cute? She's not. She's good. But they want. They, they just. They just want to define me. They want to not let me be. And so I know that context. So that's kind of. I'm putting that against the fact. The fact that in America you have to be defined if you're a black person. So I, I don't know how much option that Zelina has. She thinks she has option, but I don't. The students have defined her and the faculty have defined her and they have that expectation. So it's kind of like what I'm playing with. Hi, I appreciated what you said about um, processing things before writing about them. That's resonant for me with my writing process. Um, I was wondering for um, Now Lila Notes, did you have an intended audience in mind when you were writing it? And if so, how did that impact your creative process? That's a good question. And my publisher would like to know the answer to it. <laughs> <laughs> and agents would like to know the answer to um, I don't, and it's not good and I'm not advising you to do it. Um, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing, my, I'm involved. I'm writing for the discovery, discovery of what I'm finding out and for the thrill I get, which you do, you know, you write a nice sentence and two days later, they say, wow, look at that, I wrote it. Sometimes it's not good. And you have to write it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Uh, to the pleasure of writing. For the magic of what language can do, that's what I'm doing. But of course, there's another side of it, because unless all you want to do is to put your book in a drawer and just your family and your friends read it, um, I'm sure you want readers. And once you want readers, you want to you get into the industry. And the industry is a business industry. And that business industry is wanting to know the question you asked me, the market. Because if they can't figure out the market, they're not going to publish you. It's as simple as that. And I've, I resisted that for the longest while. In fact, um, I was with mainstream publishers for a long time, and I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And um, my agent didn't like it when I went to Akashic Books, which I think is the most wonderful small press there is in New York, because they have crackerjack editors. And that's what I wanted, somebody to take me seriously as a writer. But of course, we're not making any money. We're selling a, quite a few books, but we're not making any. So you have to decide. I mean, the big prize, of course, is to sell your books and to get awards. Okay, that's kind of what you want. The publishers don't interested in one of them. Um, the money for it. So the question that I would say to my to my students is that to do what I um, didn't do, which is you need to build an audience. You need to, and you you have the means to build an audience now with technology. So when you go to an agent, you say I have six hundred followers or whatever. I am totally not on social media. Media. I don't know what Facebook does or Twitter does or Instagram or any. I know the names, but I don't know what they do. Which is not good. 
And the reason I say it's not good, I am a certain age and I do not want to spend my time on the computer checking out these things. I want to spend my time writing. But if you're now starting, I would say try to do the two things together because you have to answer that question because that's the question your agent is going to ask you. And that's the question your publisher, I don't care how they put it, ultimately that's what they want to know. Good. Now, how do you get around that? Um, I think books I don't like, the, you can read a book and see, see that book is written for an audience. You, I have no time for that. So you, 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 summon. You decide which way you want to go. I will tell you, there's a lot of satisfaction in writing a book that you discover and that kind of. Uh, following Donna's question, um, when you're in uh, moments of struggle, who are writers that you turn to and what do you draw from them in terms of uh, inspiration and what, what powers you forward? If I tell you the book I'm reading right now, which I told the class, I'm rereading for the third time, middle March. Now you'll say, my God, that has nothing to do with what you're writing. But the first thing I'm doing is how big that book is. And so I get that inspiration that this woman just to write that book, that big book, that is a lot of discipline. She said she had to. The second thing I know, notice is that very soon um, you have the characters right there and you see what their problems are and you know what the place is and you know what's going on there, what the politics, and there's a lot of politics going on in that novel. Uh, and a lot of humor going on. So it's, it, so it, I, I give you that example that I'm doing. So I, I'm reading it almost every night, not too many pages, about five or six. But when I get up in the morning and I start writing, that's the energy I'm bringing with me. Not that it has anything to do with what I'm writing, except the inspiration and the confidence and also the kind of craft, knowing why she got me engaged. A book written over a hundred years ago. Why did she get me engaged? Did I come tomorrow, to not the next night, not tonight, but the next night, and I'm reading again. Then I read other writers for a different reason, because that's a different kind of style, you know, it's long, long passages to do something and whatever, that you really can't write like that today. But I'm reading, I reread, there are two novels I reread almost for craft, Philip Roth's Indignation, because my son, who's not a reader of fiction, I gave him that book, and he's, he doesn't read anything I write unless I'm fortunate. But he, he, he couldn't put it down. Well, why, I want to know, somebody who's not a writer, why couldn't you not put that book down? Um, and it's not about him, it's Philip Roth talking about New Jersey Jewish community. I mean, he's, he's in. And, um, and I think that novel, although I don't think it's the best of Roth's novel, teaches you about craft in the biggest way. Everything holds in that novel, everything, craft wise, that small little novel. So I read that for that. How did he manage to pack all of this? How does he manage to get my African-American son to get engaged in a life that's totally different from him? And then I read Could See, Could See on GM Could See on, or I read Johnson, Could See or Could See. Um, I made my students read that too. And as I said to the last class, because he's able in just, how in God's name can he in two pages you know the setting, you know the character, you know what the problem is, you, you know everything. The economy of his words. So I'm looking at that, and I love people like Marilyn Robinson, who's on and on and on and on, you know. <laughs> slowly and surely, it's such a slow, slow book. But as slow as that book is, you can't put it down. You know, you just, so that's what I mean. Uh, I, I think you, I think you first have to, you should surround yourself with books that you have read and you just fell in love with 
and then you read them again as a writer to know why you fell in love with it. And so you're reading them again, looking at the craft, looking at everything. But the first one is just a novel. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. We have uh, Elizabeth's books on sale. Now Lila Knowles, and she'll be signing as well. Thanks so much. Oh, that's the um, Edith's question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Ye